how much money do we make from YouTube? We thought, <laughs> we thought it was about time that we were honest with our viewers and our listeners about the kind of revenue that we get from YouTube. Yeah, and then halfway through, we're going to take a break and do our last retrospective catch-up vlog before we get to real time. And it's on, isn't it? Something particularly oh, important. Yes, sorry. It's <laughs> on possibly our most favourite anchorage ever. Yes. But more on that in a bit. I think, first of all, we need to discuss why we are discussing the crude subject of money. <laughs> Yes. What's the reason for it? Well, it came as a result of the video podcast we did two weeks ago, uh, which was all about... What's it called? Well, it, it, it was really about the integrity of YouTube sailing channels. Yeah. Um, and I think we've kind of put that one to bed, but one thing did arise from it, mm. which I really wanted to address. Yeah, you had some direct correspondence with someone who managed to get hold of you. Yes. And talk to you directly about something. Yeah, so they sent a, they sent a private message to me and uh, they didn't want to be named, but their message went along the lines of uh, some of the feedback we are getting behind the scenes is that follow the boat, want to impress the officials and are doing this for their own good. Yes, because people thought that we were just saying, don't be nasty, don't be unpleasant, don't swear, don't do this, don't do that. We were laying down the rules and we were doing it for somebody else. But yes. it wasn't the case. No, I don't think so. Well, I know so. We, of course we weren't. <laughs> um, I, the fact is we've been cruising in Southeast Asia for over a decade. And we have been permanently based here for a decade. And during that time, not only have we got an understanding generally of the culture here, but we've made a lot of friends. And some of those friends are indeed officials yeah. and people that organise rallies and marina owners and so on. Um, but I think the point is, is that we have no need to impress these people. Uh, we don't get anything for it. We'll That's the important thing. We get nothing for it. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk a bit more yeah. about that in a moment. But the, the fact is, these, you know, the officials that we were referring to, they know us. They know who we are. We know who they are. So um, there was there was no real reason to try and Im impress anyone, really. We no. were literally just speaking from the heart. But we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, I think when I read that message, I was... First of all, I was actually really quite surprised. Shocked that, that anyone would think that about us. Are we being disingenuous? Are we being naive? Hmm. Do you think that's natural? I wonder how many people watched, who watched that channel thought we were getting something for saying that. Yeah, I'd be interested to know. Because after my initial shock of reading this comment, I thought, well, actually, it's quite a reasonable hmm. suggestion. Yeah. I mean, you know, let's face it, we're pretty well established now. Uh, in the cruising world. We've been doing it for 20 odd years and people know who we are. So perhaps it isn't unreasonable to think that, well, during this time, we've managed to build up contacts, uh, make loads of money from our sailing endeavours through various means. Maybe it's completely reasonable to think like that. And that's why we wanted to do this, because we really wanted to set the record straight. Yeah, we're going to give you some actual figures on what YouTube pays us to do this. Now, this is us. Loads of other people out there get completely different payments or amounts per month, some a lot more, some, some a little bit less. So we are going to give you that figure. One more thing before that, Lois. Do you know how much it costs YouTubers to make videos in the first place? It's not all bunts. It actually, we do, and people always say this, but I just wonder how many pe viewers take it in, that it does cost us actual money. And you did a, a breakdown on how much it costs us, didn't you? Yeah, we did all sorts of breakdowns just to try and put it in context. But some pretty straightforward numbers that go towards producing every single video we do, we have to pay for these subscriptions. And the first is $15 a month for uh, copyright free music. Now we spent many years before these services were even available looking for copyright free yeah. music and it would always bite us in the bum because after using a track, two years down the line, that artist would decide to release that tra track and suddenly you'd get a copyright strike from YouTube. And it was difficult to find it and there wasn't very much, because we're talking 10 years ago now, there weren't very much available for mm. you. Um, and it was, it took up so much time just finding the right music, I remember that. Yeah, and, and the music, let's face it, you could do without it. And yeah. to be honest, most of the time when we use music, it's generally a sort of background music, but it does help set the scene sometimes. So yeah. it's not something that I want to relinquish. It's, it's a necessity. I yes. think. We are using less though, aren't we? Well, I don't know. I mean, we still, I think we still use on average at least two different tracks every episode. Okay. Mm. You know, so yeah. I think it's worth it. 
perhaps the biggest <laughs> fee, and this is very contentious currently yeah. if you're sort of in the know, but we subscribe to the Adobe Suite, and that is a suite of software products that allow us to do video ed editing using Premiere Pro. It also covers Photoshop, Lightroom, Adobe Illustrator, Dreamweaver even, which we use, After Effects. Uh, we use pretty much all of the Adobe products. And um, well, if you've been following the tech news, Adobe are uh, in hot water at the moment because they have been very naughty about a few things. And there is a big migration of artists and designers editors moving away from Adobe and it's something that I've been wanting to do for years but yeah because we're paying $59 a month that's it $59, it. $59 a month a and there's month. no option to buy it you have no. to pay it for it so you're just renting the use of it it's absolute daylight robbery anyway if you're curious about the whole um, yeah. uh, fraud that's happening at the moment go and look it up because uh, it, it's very interesting now I think some of you may say well why don't you move away and start using something like DaVinci Resolve it's something we want to do affinity instead of Photoshop these are a great alternatives but they require a steep learning curve and we're just currently not in the position to make that transition definitely not right now because we're cruising over a thousand yeah. miles so we've got lots lots ahead of us excuse me <coughs> Ooh, excuse me um, but it is something you probably will be getting to grips with at some point yep. the moment we get settled down somewhere believe me i want to move away from adobe yeah. as much as possible not photoshop though well, we have Affinity as, an alter, as a great alternative. Okay. But anyway, to be discussed another time. Yeah. Um, another cost, which I'd completely forgotten about, yes. was your one. Yeah, so I've been using TubeBuddy. You may have heard it, if you certainly would have heard of it if you're a YouTuber, because they promise all kinds of help in getting your videos seen. Uh, it hasn't made any difference to us whatsoever. So the only reason I subscribe to it is it allows me to schedule videos, which Yes, YouTube does it, but you can't schedule them and still make them available to your patrons, FTP mates and anyone else you want to see it beforehand. You just can't do that. So $19 a month, just for the sake of being able to schedule it, made sense, God, four years ago when we went through the Mentawis and we didn't have any internet connection because we couldn't mm. post them and couldn't, you know, couldn't upload them, couldn't, all of that. But internet connection now is so good, we just don't need it. We can, we can make them go live when we want now. Yeah, but I think it's important to emphasise that scheduling videos on YouTube is an important thing yeah. for the algorithm. Yes. Um, if you just upload videos as and when you fancy it, it can affect negatively uh, how you're promoted across YouTube. Do you mean like doing it at the same time every week? So exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Um, another cost is uh, internet. Now, I've put this down really as a sunk cost because this is something that we would have to pay for anyway, and we do pay for, but it's worth noting now that a lot of our videos are uh, now, they're all recorded in 4K yes. and they are much longer. The last video we uploaded, I think was something like 10 gigabytes an episode. Yeah, so we have to pay a lot for our internet to do that kind of thing, more than we would if we weren't doing this. Mm. So it is a reasonable cost to assume, I think. Yeah, yeah. How much did you put in for that? Um, well, it's difficult to say. I think we spend about uh, $10 a week on, on internet. Right. Um, but I, I kind of didn't really want to include that because it's something that we buy anyway, but it's fair mm. enough. Um, another thing that is worth considering, uh, you wanted to make a point of this, was actually the equipment that we use. Yes, you buy a lot of cameras. You do use them all. Yes. But there's also lighting. We've got lighting up at the moment, if you're watching this, and you're certainly hearing us on our lovely new mics. Yeah, and um, of course, in the marine environment, these things don't last forever. I wanted to, I don't have it in front of me, I wanted to show you my, my workhorse, which is the Panasonic GH5, and just show you the condition of it, because it is literally falling apart. Yeah. The mic input stopped working due to corrosion, so I had to buy an XLR adapter for an XLR microphone, blah, blah, blah. Um, these are things which you don't consider when you're recording, um, you know, in a salty environment, but things do deteriorate. And so we do, you know, every now and then we do spend on gear. Yeah, we have to really think very hard about it because it is expensive and it's not something we, to be honest, we can actually afford. But sometimes if we don't do it, we can't do the videos. So mm. you're very good at trying to, when you go back to the UK, kind of 
trading your old ones in when you can? I try to. And so last year we bought the Pocket 3. We've got the two mics. If you're watching, you can see us wearing uh, two remote mics. Uh, there's little things like that just to make actually vlogging easier yeah. for us. Um, but that worked out, uh, if you spread it over a year, at um, $90 a month. Yeah. Um, and that is Minimum. quite a quite a conservative estimate. Yeah. So in total there, we have an approximate figure of $193 per month yeah. that we need to make from our YouTube channel just to cover these very basic costs. Yeah. And I'm sure there are quite a few that we haven't considered. We haven't considered what I value the most important thing in life and which is worth more than money and that's time. Mm. Yes. Now, I did a little uh, back of a fag packet comparison. <laughs> uh, I went on a recruitment website and got some figures for sort of an average hourly wage of a video editor. Just assuming that we were to pay a professional video editor to put together our videos, the average hourly wage is approximately $32. And that's an average, uh, which means that per month, uh, the average video editor would be earning just over $5,000 five and a half thousand dollars. That worked on an eight hour day, is it? Uh, yes, correct. Right. Yeah. Now, again, I sort of plucked this out the air, but I worked out that we probably spend 24 hours in total man hours working on a video. OK, so you're talking about the editing that you do, the thumbnails and all that kind of stuff, yeah? Yeah. Now, bear in mind, some episodes can take me five days just to edit mm. and other episodes I can do in a day. But of course, there's all your time spent a lot of time admin because mm. although we spend all this money on internet, it's not very good. So I do spend waste an awful lot of my time just trying to get things uploaded and sorted out um, live. And yeah, I do spend a lot of time. And in a way, you could you could count me as marketing. Mm. I just think market, marketing people are um, sort of half my business. Probably get more per hour even than editors. But yeah. Anyway. But based on a 24 hours per episode, yeah. so and approximately four episodes a month, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's three, um, that's about $3,000 we would expect to be paid for that based on those average video editor costs. But even if you were the lowest paid editor at about $11 an hour, yeah. uh, we would still expect to get about a, a grand a month. And I have to say our editing skills and our marketing skills are, I would say, you know, we're not top, top, but we're pretty bloody good at them. Yes, editing certainly. Marketing, I just don't have time because it's such a time-consuming thing to do that properly. So I do what I can. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so a thousand dollars a month we would be paid normally for doing this, and we do it At for minimum. free. Yeah. We do it for the love. Of course. And I we mean, do love it. Yeah, I think this is so important to emphasize with this video is that uh, all these figures aside and all these costs aside, we are doing this for the love of it, yeah. and I think that will become apparent <laughs> when we tell you what our monthly YouTube yes. income is. Before that though, <gasps> no, before that, I just want to say to those watching, there are even YouTube channels, and they're not as big as some of the huge channels, that use full-time editors to edit their videos. They actually do do that. And I know of at least one channel that has had um, a photographer on board, photographing as well. I mean, yeah. do, doing the actual video, the cameraman doing the work. Imagine what their overheads are. Those people are paying a lot of money to get that editing done and so forth. So, uh, yeah, just wanted to put that in. But mm. go on. Well, do you want the figure? <laughs> yeah, go on. OK. Uh, for, for those listening, I'll tell you the figure. If you're watching, what I'll, what I'll try and do is I'll try and take a photograph of my bank statement because my banking app won't allow me to do a screenshot. So here it is. As of June 2024, our payment from Google came in at £95, which is 121 Thanks, YouTube. That's really great. <laughs> but as we said, we need to cover that off. Uh, we our, our overheads are one hundred ninety-three dollars. So to make each video is actually a loss. We're making a loss each time we put one of these episodes out. Just so as you know, that mm. is how it works. So the question is, <laughs> why is it so low? Yeah, why is it so? Low? I'd love to know. God, we've, there are loads of theories out there. Go well, on, I, I one thing, of course, is that we have seen a, a decline in yeah. YouTube income. Now, I have to say this is across the board. We know for a fact that all YouTube channels have seen a decline across the board. Yeah. However, ours seems to have really dropped we've, off the end of the scale. We've dropped off the edge. I mean, we used to get uh, more views uh, and subsequently more income. I remember $500 coming in. Yeah. I think uh, once we hit six hundred odd dollars wow. a month, yeah. um, but it just wasn't sustained, and and each month that figure is going down. Now, of course, 
the algorithm is always changing. And this is something that uh, all YouTubers know and trying to keep up with the algorithm um, it is a pain in the ass. Um, if you miss an episode, we talked about scheduling and uploading frequently. Mm. I can think of one instance when we were offline um, sailing down the Mentawi Islands mm -hmm. and we missed an episode. And the next one we put out, it got barely any views. And that was one of our favourite episodes, which was sailing to Krakatoa. It is mad. It is mad. And it's amazing. If you watch YouTube and read articles, they will tell you. YouTube tells you all the time. doesn't matter. doesn't matter if you... Mm. But it's just not true because YouTubers will tell you it does matter. It really does matter. If you miss, YouTube drops you like a stone. I don't care what they say, it does. I don't actually think that people that run it know what their algorithm is doing. It's a <laughs> mind of its own, that thing. I really think so. Well, you've done your own experiments, yes. haven't you, with, you know, as a YouTube subscriber, as a viewer? I have. Um, I've now got Liz Clear as my um, my own way of going in and watching things because I was watching things on Follow the Boat that don't interest him at all. So I'll watch him just as, as Liz Clear privately. And I've got a few, I don't know, I've got about 20 channels that I follow. And I've noticed over the months that a few of them I no longer get notifications for. And this is only it's less than a year I've been doing this. And these are people I watch every week. I have to search them out and see if they've done a new one because they don't appear in my feed as, as new. That's already that's happening. And on top of that, what's really weird is channels I've never even watched are appearing in my feed as channels that I've suddenly subscribed to and I haven't. That really opened my eyes. I've got no idea we've had how quite, that happened. We've had quite a few people say to us, oh, I didn't know you were still making videos. These are subscribers. People subscribe to our channel who have stopped watching us because they're not getting recommended. Yeah. And they've come back to us. I mean, one guy after, I think it was about two or three years later, he came back and said, hey, you're still making videos. Excellent. I didn't know you were making videos. Well, if he subscribed to us on YouTube, why is he not getting those updates? Oh, well, I don't know why I'm not getting the updates from my very small amount of time I've been subscribed to channels. I think it's just unforgivable. It's not fair. Mm. Life isn't fair, is it? Yeah. Well, of course, you know, let's be realistic as well. YouTube is saturated now with YouTube sailing channels. When we yeah. first started, we were literally one of five. Yes. And uh, since then, there are many, many more channels. And uh, one viewer has only got so much time in the day to, to stay abreast of these channels. And they yeah. have more choice. And, you know, this is a good thing, I think, yes. for, from the viewer's point of view. This is great. And finally, let's admit it. We have been going now, and I said to you, didn't I? We've been going for 20 years. That is an entire generation. An entire generation has been born, brought up, and is now watching YouTube. And we just don't represent the, uh, the younger viewers. No, we don't. Let's be honest. Let's really be honest. And also, <laughs> did we started before YouTube did. Follow yeah. the boat's older than YouTube. <laughs> well, there's another example of the algorithm. I think we've said this before, that the older the channel you are, the less you get promoted. So if you're a new channel, you're more likely to be promoted by the algorithm. Our channel actually even predates the whole monetization yes. thing. You know, we've had this channel since 2007, I think. I'm, I can't remember exactly. Uh, but it's pretty old. Yeah. Um, so it does mean, because of all this, that you have to spend a massive amount of your time marketing, getting out on social media and putting loads out. Now, if anyone watches SLV, Sailing the Vagabond, I do occasionally, They every time I go in, in Instagram, they're there all the time, every day, one a day, I mean, just all the time. And some of the other bigger channels, I just see them on Facebook and Instagram all the time. Now, you don't even use social media, hate it so much. But uh, they are working really hard to keep up with, with their success, which is great. But it does involve a lot of time. And to be honest, can't be asked. I think that's a, So we said right at the beginning, <laughs> 10 years ago or whenever it was when we first started actually monetizing the channel, we said, and we always said it, when this becomes like a job, we'll give it up. Because we feel it just for us. Yes it detracts from the sailing adventure. And I think the problem now with all this, uh, the, the interconnectivity of social media from making sure that you've timed your Instagram post to coincide with your latest YouTube mm. release and the TikTok mm. short and so on, we just have no interest in it. Mm. And unfortunately, that does impact our views. Yeah. Um, it's one of those reasons. And it's also one of the reasons why you see other YouTube sailing channels have this high prominence because they are spending all this time making sure that they are forefront of mind 
in whatever YouTube, social media, sorry, a channel that you use. And those are the bigger ones, and I think they're having to tread water to keep to keep their position. Smaller channels, and let's admit there are a plethora of them now. A lot of people are going sailing and doing that. Are ecstatic if they reach five thousand subs, and it's you know, you know, it's really, really hard for new people to break through. It's very tough business now. It's not like it was, and we got to the stage where we were starting to be like that. We were starting right to tread, you know, doing loads and loads. We're doing shorts and all this rubbish and reels and stuff like that uh, to promote our YouTube. And of course, you can't promote YouTube very well on Facebook for a start. It hates YouTube. Yep. So that's a real pain in the ass. And then we suddenly thought, why are we doing this? We don't even like doing all this bit of it. What we like doing is the sailing, the filming and the editing. And the travelling. And I the think that's, yeah. that's another point as well, is, is that we have always been travel first mm. and sailing. And of course, if you're a new viewer and you come to our channel and we happen to do an episode when we go to Komodo and see the dragons on land mm. or like Krakatoa and we climb Krakatoa, and it doesn't involve sailing, then of course, you know, those people may not be interested. Now, of mm. course, our longer term, more uh, loyal viewers know us. They mm. know that one week they'll get travel and the other week they'll get just sailing. Or maintenance or talking mm. to people or, you know, it, it's whatever's going through our head at the moment. And that's how we want to keep it. We don't want to try and fit into a box. We don't want to be this or that. We want to be what we want to be. You're an artist, you're a creative, and you want to put out your good stuff, and that's it. Yeah, I think ultimately we just want to tell our story, and Follow the Boat has always been about telling a story, yes. and whether that story is on land or at sea, or in a boatyard, uh, it is what it is. It's wherever we happen to be and whatever we fancy uh, putting out. Okay. Is that the end of part one or is there anything else? That's the end of part one. So uh, there's going to be a part two, which I'll explain in a moment, but then we're going back to part three, which is when we're going to talk about how channels supplement their incomes because YouTube, as you've now learnt, doesn't pay very much money. So the real money comes in through sponsorship and other things. And we're going to talk about that when we get, come back from the next bit. Yes, right. So the next bit is, as I said earlier, it's our catch up. After this catch up, we will almost be in real time and future vlog sections of our longer form format will be much closer to real time. And that's what we're trying to do. But this one in particular is of a certain anchorage that we rate as possibly one of our most favouritest <laughs> anchorages we have ever come across. Every once in a while, we stumble upon an anchorage that's so comfortable, so beautiful and so protected, it becomes our second home. With its wildlife, white beach and flat water, it's easy to resist any temptation to leave Asahan. We ended up staying here through circumstance, specifically to see out an unfavourable season of northwesterly squalls. The island isn't on the path to anywhere, you have to seek it out. It's for those of us who need a place to rest or a safe haven in any wind. Cruisers in the area know its location, and yet it remains far enough off the beaten track for few of them to spend much time here. For those that come, it means tranquil days and an unhurried lifestyle. Unusually for us, we took a mooring laid by the island's village council. We tend to avoid moorings as a rule, but these are maintained by local man RD, and we were able to take a known secure spot close in to shore. One mosque on the island isn't used for the morning call to prayer, so instead we enjoyed being woken up by a chorus of birds and insects ashore just a hundred metres from our boat. Early morning is the best time of day to appreciate this spot in the southwest of Lombok, and we quickly got into a routine, something else we rarely manage when moving about and cruising. I'd get up before first light to take the short trip ashore in one of our kayaks. 
Knowing that Jamie would be following later, I'd leave the kayak with its nose pointing in the direction I'd be walking, so Jamie knew where I'd gone that day. Those walks, once or sometimes twice a day depending on the tide, were times for introspection. I guess they call it mindfulness these days. It was during our time in Asahan that beachcombing became my obsession. Shells in particular were a fascination, and I began to collect them. Once I was told to leave the shells on the beach by a tourist, a sentiment I agree with, by the way. But what he didn't know was that I measure, identify and photograph my shells and put them back in the water. With Jamie's supervision, I set up a workstation on Esper to use the focus stacking feature on his Panasonic GM5. It allows me to achieve a clear image with a deep depth of field. Apart from keeping a record of what I found, I'm hoping to use these images in a few art projects I have planned. I didn't just find shells. There are sponges, coral, seeds, sea-worn roots or branches, and all kinds of knick-knacks in the intertidal zone. I was privileged to save a washed-up baby octopus who squirted me with ink when I released him into deeper water. And I had a hand in saving any number of animals stranded on the dry, hot sand, including a struggling sea hare and all kinds of sea snails. Once, a sea crate slithered across my path, out of the waves and into the shadows of the rocks, a much less intimidating experience than Jamie's when he found one brushing against his leg in Esper's cockpit one night. But our morning routine really revolved around kayaking to one of the few resorts for jugs of Lombok coffee and sometimes fresh te jahe, ginger tea. The pleasure here was spending time with a few other cruisers caught in the same situation as us under the dappled light of tropical trees in the Amahelia Resort Garden, we chew the fat and discuss other boats as they came and went across the bay. We'd arranged provisioning trips into town with local man Sappy, who drove us on a two-hour journey each way to Mataram, Lombok's capital. This required Aris, brother-in-law of R.D., to ferry us across the bay in his spider boat, affectionately known as the Batmobile because of the transfer stickers on the wooden dodger. So here we are back home and this is the usual procedure. I'm getting Liz to do it because I'm recording, normally it's me. But Aris very carefully comes around the back of Esper. His outriggers are wide enough that uh, they come out the outside of Esper and he'll just come up alongside the back. We've got the swimming platform to Liz to step onto. I'll just hold onto the dinghy just to fend off Aris's boat and uh, so yeah, it's pretty straightforward. We were well looked after by the local people of Asahan, in particular the staff at Amahelia, like Hendra, Tony and Habibi. Most of the villagers are Javanese settlers who moved to lesser populated islands across the country during Indonesia's transmigration programme, an initiative to move landless or poor people from densely populated areas to less populous islands. Having all this spare time allowed me to play more with my photography too, pushing my creative skills to find subjects to photograph on an island only half a mile wide. With more than a handful of cameras to play with, not to mention some lenses that rarely see the light of day, it was an opportunity to experiment without the pressure of passage planning, boat maintenance and video editing. Those early morning walks and the late afternoon strolls provided great light, albeit with scant human presence. For the nerds among you, the cameras used here are the Sony full-frame A7C, the APS-C censored Fujifilm XE2S, as well as one of my Micro Four Third Panasonic cameras, the GM5.
It was a wrench to leave our own private hideaway, but the real world wanted us back, and we left with happy memories of having made friends forever. That was Asahan, and I think now you'll have an idea of why it's one of our favourite anchorages. I will go so far as to say it is my favourite anchorage all time for staying anywhere for any length of time. Can't yeah. think of anyone better. Well, I can think of one more which you've yet to see, which will be up and <laughs> yes. coming in a future blog mm. when we're closer to real time. Um, I think also it's worth mentioning that that little episode you saw, for me, is where I want to go creatively. It's a little bit more sort of documentary style, a bit more voiceover, less talking heads. We said less talk, fewer talking heads, less talking heads to camera. Uh, and that's just an example of what we'd like to do. They're quite involved, but um, let us know what you think of that style of vlog episode. Yeah, I love it. Yes. Don't mind doing the voiceovers now. I've finally got used to it after all these years. Right, so going on from where we were before we were so beautifully interrupted, we need to explain to viewers and listeners why you will see YouTubers going on and on and on about being supported by Patreon all the time, ad infinitum, boringly. You now know we don't really do that anymore because we've just put a line under it. But most of us do need to supplement our income in some way to cover the costs. Even though we do it as a hobby and we love it, it is nice to get some people to, to sponsor. It's not a sponsor, is it? Sort of, it's like people drop us a few quid here and there because they like what we do. That's how we see it. Yeah. So the first thing we want to talk about really is promotion, sponsorship and endorsements. And you've got some very strong opinions on this. I have. Um, we just don't do promotions. Uh, and going back, very, uh, going back to what we were originally talking about, which was being in the pockets of these yeah. authorities, it is worth explaining we never take discounts from marinas from boat yards haul out facilities we don't take discounts from restaurants cafes resorts anywhere you see us recording we have not approached these people and asked for a discount no, never. there is one exception and that was when a marina manager was wanting to promote a new service for their marina and approached yeah. us to put together a promotional video which we agreed to and in return, we got one week's free mooring at their marina. The irony is, is that we spent that week editing the video <laughs> for him. So. He probably would have left. <laughs> and it was fun doing it. I enjoyed doing that. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Um, but there are, I can think of historically, there yeah. have been four or five little sponsorships we have done just to be transparent because we don't do it anymore. Uh, two of them actually predate our YouTube channel anyway. Long time ago. First one was in Turkey. Mm. It's our Rock Naranka, which we go on all the about, about all the time because we absolutely love it. Yep. 2007 we got our Rock Naranka. Mark one. The same Rock Naranka. Still on the front. The one that's holding us in place right now. So we approached Rock We did. And we, we paid cost for it, basically. Yeah. Well, they had to ship it from New Zealand to Turkey. Well, they actually shipped it to Greece and we oh, went to go right. and, we went So to we go paid for the shipping. Yeah. Um, and another one that's similar to that was mm. the Porter boat. Yeah. Uh, again, um, we didn't pay much for it and we did a whole feature on it. We actually did videos as well and this was before we monetized our YouTube channel, but yeah. we put together some videos which they then put on their website. Um, and again, that completely predated uh, the monetization of our YouTube channel. But there were two things we really wanted and we really felt that there was a great fit because that's what we do and they loved it and we didn't get paid but we got beautiful items that we have really used. Well. Yeah, and the other one was of course, the, I remembered recently, was the Aussie fridge. Oh yes. Um, and again, this, is, this highlights what we were doing at the time, which was, shit, we need a new fridge. Yeah. Um, let's do our research first. Let's find out what is the best fridge on the market. What is the best anchor on the market? And so we approached them and said, hey, look, we want to buy an Aussie fridge, for yeah. example. Um, but also we have a YouTube channel. We can do a video on, on, on us installing it, yeah. if you like. Yeah. 
And they kindly came back and said, yeah, sure. Again, same thing. Uh, we paid cost for yeah, it. Yeah, we paid for it. Yeah. And uh, we did a whole a whole video on it. Yeah. But even that was many years ago. And I have to say, happily, the Aussie fridge is still running. It is a bloody good piece of equipment. Yeah, yeah. So these products, we had approached the manufacturer uh, rather than vice versa. But we get approached by all kinds of stupid companies daily. Daily. All the time, all day long in our emails. Yeah, we, emails. we could make a habit of taking on every single sponsorship suggestion that we get. We did two. Now we did two. <laughs> One uh, was for a watch. I don't know if any of you guys remember this. Again, it was many years ago. And quite rightly, you guys called us out on this. You said, what on earth are you doing? <laughs> a little sponsorship, two minute piece on watches nothing to do with sailing they weren't even waterproof and um, i have to say i felt a bit awkward doing it in the first yeah. place but we'd kind of agreed to it yeah they sent us the watches so we, oh, all right. and then the only other one were some deck shoes well actually they were beach shoes but mm. funny enough we did really like i'm still wearing mine they yeah. are they are good but those were the only two i can think of where they approached us and it meant having to put them into the video having to find a way during one of the episodes to talk about them and to promote them. And I don't know about you, I hate that when I watch videos, not not necessarily sailing, but any video that's got this, oh, and by the way, I've got this lovely thing and you must buy it because it's great. Shut up. <laughs> I'm not watching you for that. Adverts are bad enough on YouTube, let alone that. There, and there is one other sponsorship, which was, well, I say sponsorship, it was Zoom sales. Yeah. And uh, we got our Code Zero again for cost, or did we even get No, Code Zero was, uh, was basically free because we'd already had the, all our sales changed by Zoom sales. And we did quite a lot of coverage on that. So Craig didn't charge us very much for those. We covered, we covered his, all of his costs for their sales. So that was a really good deal. Mm. And then he came to us and said, look, I've got this new process for printing. Um, I could put it on a Code Zero. Do you fancy one? Yeah, you, mean, you mean Phil, not Craig. You said Craig. Phil. Phil of Zoom Oh, Sales. yeah, of course. Phil. Sorry, yeah. Phil. Sorry, Phil. <laughs> we haven't spoken to Phil for no, years, actually. No, years. But he asked um, us if we could do it and if we could come up with something really colourful. He did. And also, we did, off the back of that, we actually did an extra episode where we sat down and talked to him. And it was mm. titled something like Chat with a Sale Maker. Mm. So it actually made really interesting and relevant content to what we were doing. Yeah. So we had no qualms about that. Yeah. But again... That was years ago. Yeah. We haven't done anything like that since yeah. then. And we just don't really like doing it because we feel it it, it breaks up the story that we're telling. Yeah. It just, we, I don't know. It just, well, the sales didn't because that was the, that was the episode mm. talking about sales. And the fridge didn't because it was about installing a whole new, uh, you know, process of, of, of our fridges. Mm. And all that. So it's that... It's not breaking anything up. And if someone, to, someone were to come along now and say, I've got the best solar panels in the world, I want you to have mine, get rid of your old ones and have mine, that would be something we might think about. Yes. Because we would do a whole thing on how they work and, and installing them. Same with the water maker. Things that we really think are important. If someone were to approach us on, we, I wouldn't say no if we could make a whole episode out of it yes and if it really meant something yes yeah yes. i think that's a good point actually yeah. that you say it does follow our story it doesn't break up the story because we happen to need those items at the time anyway so yeah it's, it's a it's a it's a good point um and as you say i you know sponsorship items of things that are completely irrelevant yeah uh, are just they're, they're frustrating and i think in terms of you guys who are, happen to be watching this on youtube I think it's just a fair exchange. You have to watch a few second adverts here and there mm. in exchange for, you know, watching our video. You can skip them, usually. I always skip them. I tend, skip to, sk them. Tend to skip them as well. Yeah. I, we don't use ad blockers, by the way. It's just something that I just don't like doing because I know there are many other YouTube uh, content creators out there who do rely on their income from YouTube. So I think it's fair enough that you get to watch the odd ad yeah. every now and then. But don't feel you've got to watch it all the way through don't feel we've got to do that. Watch the video all the way through, that's better for us. Yes. <laughs> the least you can do is just hit that like button. Yay! So, okay, you mentioned Patreon. Now, yes. obviously, this is a known quantity. Everyone, I think, knows what Patreon is. And uh, Just explain for those that don't. There may be some people who've never heard of it. Well, it's a way of tipping on a monthly basis. Uh, you uh, can tip any amount that you want. It may be, depending on what the creator has set up, you fall into a certain tier. And in return, you get 
something stuff. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically like buy us a beer, but it's a regular payment that you sign up to through Patreon. Now, when we started, or rather after a year or so of having Patreon, and back in the heyday <laughs> when sponsoring YouTube channels through Patreon was a thing, mm -hmm. uh, we did pretty well out of it. Yeah. We, we were close to 400 Patreons, yeah. believe uh, it or about not. About 398, I think we got to. Well, I know it was, it was near 400, but wasn't quite 400, because we said when we hit 400 patrons, we're going to start inviting people to come and sell with us. And we never hit the 400 no, we never mark. did. Just, do you know, it's a really big thing for us, because we don't like having other people on the boat, generally. Well, speak for yourself. <laughs> Friends and family. We struggle with each other. No, no, it's like... bad enough. <laughs> but yeah, so we, we, were, we were doing really, really well. And to be honest, there weren't many sailing channels back then. Yeah. Um, it, the market wasn't flooded, and it was great. It, it, it worked really well we were always a bit reluctant to talk about it on, on screen because we're very we're British you may not not notice that but we're British and we are very reticent ever talking about money and earnings and that kind of thing we find our American friends are much better at being very upfront about that come and support us da, da, da. and it was a really hard took a year for us to really get into that yeah that's it's, it's very true yeah. but we do still have patron Oh yeah. We um, however, uh, what happened was something happened when Patreon got into hot water about over something. I don't remember what it oh, was. I do. Um, Free speech. Okay, <laughs> but a lot of our supporters stopped using Patreon. They said we're not going to use Patreon, you know, in protest to what uh, yeah. they were doing. So they said to us. Well, if you can come up with an alternative way, then perhaps uh, we'll continue to support you. And that's when we went away and developed FTB Mates. Yes. That's why FTB Mates exists. Yes. It's an alternative to Patreon. And we set it up for those people initially. Yes, they were very reluctant to leave us. We had lots of conversations with our lovely patrons saying, no, we want to support you, but you know, this just we're not going to do it this way. You spent a very long time doing this. Yeah, so I was a web developer. One of the many things I did uh, before I started sailing so I spent two solid months and it was literally working every day to build a framework off the back of followtheboat.com to accommodate a payment system and this is using plugins and a little bit of JavaScript and, and all the basic HTML stuff to create this membership only section, this area that was in my opinion far superior to mm. Patreon mm. Um, and a lot of people moved over and it yeah. was great. It was great. The only yeah. problem was that it required so much <laughs> upkeep. Yes. I mean, even to this day, now that we've pared it down, it, it does require a lot of upkeep and also some costs, which we'll come on to in a second. But just going back to Patreon, mm. we went from 400 yep. to 48. Today, at the time of recording this, we've now got 48 fantastic, gorgeous, lovable patrons. <laughs> And Many we, of them have been with us all the way through. They have, yes. And we thank you all. Fantastic. And we thank all our past patrons as yes. well, of course. And we know that people come and go. New, yes. ch new channels come along, so people like to support a new channel instead. Um, and we've had some great patrons in the past who have now since moved on. But thank you all for that, Indeed. we should say. Um, but going on to FTB Mates... Um, so, one of, so you had all the setup. Yes. Which cost a lot, and it's, I think there's a running cost as well. Yeah. $49 a month, is that what you've written in? Yeah. We've got, we've got notes in front of us, is that right? So, obviously, we have to pay for some plugins which handle the secure payment system to mm -hmm. allow people to use their credit cards on our website. Um, we pay for a, an annual fee for that. There's a couple of other plugins we require, but most importantly, was our hosting costs. Mm. Um, they had to go up as well because of the increase in traffic that we were getting. Our website was grinding to a halt, mm. and so we do pay quite high hosting costs for that. But it equates to $49 a month <laughs> just to money. keep that uh, up and running. Yeah, so every donation that is made, you know, a little bit goes because most people pay through PayPal, and there's the other one, Stripe. Stripe, yeah. And they both take a chunk. With Patreon, we lost even more money because Patreon takes a lot out of mm. the amount of money people pay. And then if you pay, usually it's PayPal, and then PayPal takes a lot. So paying YouTube channels through PayPal, just remember, you know, they all take a load. We don't see all of that money. If anyone's trying to do some little calculations in their head, you've got to take quite a lot of it off. So we did have 106 
Yeah, we had mates. 106 moved over from Patreon. A few joined us, um, and that's it was 400 now, 106. So that's sort of both Patreon and FTB support. When we first started out, around 400, now 106. No, 106 was what we had on FTB mates. Four year, a few years ago, we've now got fifty-eight mates. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Oh, I'm no. jumping ahead in my notes. I'm giving <laughs> the I'm giving the total figure. But as you can see, that on FTB mates, we got you know it has declined. But yes. In total. Yes. Combining those two, from four hundred to one hundred and six today, as of today. One hundred and six extremely special, important people for whom we would like to say thank you very much. We love you. Thank you. Well right. Said. Going on from that, then we have a shop. And lots of channels have shops. Some are better than others. Ours is not very good. I disagree. <laughs> I completely disagree. I think our shop is fantastic. Yeah. But again, it goes back to the fact that we don't Market. promote it. Mm -hmm. We yeah. just don't promote oh, it. Oh, hang on. And we just don't... Oh, there we go. If you're watching, there's one of our mugs. It's actually one of our best sellers. We love this mug. Absolutely love it. And again, it, it's just something that we, we don't want to harp on about it. No. We're shy of being a business. That's our problem. Also, we don't want to be one. Yes, I, I, I think I think that's what it comes down to. So anyway, after all of this, <laughs> should we just uh, wrap up with some some conclusions? Conclusions. Um, so as you can see, having a YouTube channel, in order to produce this level of content, it requires a bit of um, outlay at our end. Yeah. And as we have seen, it actually costs us more than what we make from yes. YouTube. <laughs> but we do get some help from our lovely supporters on Patreon and FTP mates, but we don't get support through any kind of sponsorship because we don't like it. Other channels do, and they probably do really well. Good for them. We're not a business. We don't want to be a business. That's the way it's going to remain, isn't it? It is. But I think all of this, uh, if you wrap it up, it, it's worth emphasising something that we've always said is that you cannot rely on money that you make through your sailing endeavours unless you're one of those top two channels mm. from your YouTube channel. Yeah. If you want this lifestyle, you need to have another source of income yeah. to supplement it. It's so important. And we have been completely transparent about this from the outset in yeah. that we have a little property that we rent out and that has always been the majority of our income. It's our bread and butter. It's yeah. what we need. We can survive just on that if we had to, but it is nice getting the bumps. We get a few other ways of making money, but that's it. You can't rely on YouTube at all, especially as a newbie, unless you're going to make it a full-time job. If you're going to make it a real proper SEO, social media, full-time job, then maybe you will. The other thing is, you, I know people do buy viewers and likes and all that oh, sort of thing. Oh, yes. We know that for a fact because we've had a couple of YouTube channels admit that they do this. Yeah. They, buy, they are buying subscribers and they are buying likes to boost up their numbers. And in fact, it's something that YouTube does not see as being illegal. They don't have a problem with really? this. Really? Yep. Oh. Yep, because it gosh. still counts as a valid view. Now, whether that view is a quality view or whether it's just some random person in the other side of the world not interested in just being paid a few quid to, to watch your... It, it's beside the point. An AI. Yeah, but um, yeah, people do do it and it is le supposedly legitimately one way of increasing your viewership. We just don't do that. And neither do we do promotions. We just find that they get in the way of our storytelling. Yeah. So it will remain a hobby. Yeah, I think that's the important thing. It's something we enjoy. Yeah. We love putting these together. Yeah. And, uh, but off the back of that, anyone who does support us, we are eternally grateful because it, it does help a little. It does it, help a little. I mean, I would say, just going on about the hobby thing, I would say that if you are going to do this, if you're not already a cruiser and you're thinking about doing this, you have got to have a hobby because there's a lot of sitting around. Unless you're going to be one of those people that keeps going around the world, never stops, non-stop, and there are people like that, who are always sailing. There's a lot of empty time in between the sailing and the maintenance and the yeah. travelling on land, and you need to fill it with something. And that could be anything. You could yeah. Maybe you like your nature, you like going for early morning walks, maybe have a, a pet dog. We met someone the other day. He takes his dog for walks three times a day, keeps him active, um, keeps him keeps him fit. Yeah. Uh, we know bird watching is a big one. Yeah, artists. There's all kind of yes. artists uh, and anything digital as well. And now these days with power on board, it's easier to run laptops and internet connections. So there's a whole plethora of things that you can do to keep yourself entertained. It just so happens that storytelling, either through words 
or through video or photographs is what we like doing. That's what we've always done since mm. we've known each other, which is more than 20 years. It just happens to be through YouTube. God, has it been that long? I know. <laughs> 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 Should we wrap it up? Yeah, well, I think, we've, I think we've wrapped it up. I yeah. think the next episode, so we are now in the middle of doing our long journeys. We've got another 120 mile passage to do in a couple of days. Uh, but where we can, we will try and now fit in our more recent catch ups mm. when we finally leave Lombok and start on this, this journey. I would love to do one of these when we're talking to camera about a subject when we're sailing again. That was great fun. Yeah, we did that in the last, episode didn't we? We were anchoring yeah, yeah. that's right yeah. So some of that fun. was recorded while sailing and it was good fun yeah. yeah so hopefully we'll do that for the next episode but in the meantime thank you to everyone not just our supporters but you guys who are watching and you guys who are listening as well yeah. uh, we really do appreciate it. Peace and fair winds. Bye. <laughs>